Chairman, I wonder if you'd allow me a few moments to talk about somebody who I admired, had immense courage, Richard Wilson. Richard was a great counsellor. We can't say that about everyone, but Richard was a great counsellor, highly respected by all of us in our Conservative group, and I know many of the opposition groups had a great deal of time for Richard. Both here and at Working Borough Council. Richard stood up for his residents. That probably for me is one of the most important things I could say about a councillor. Did he or did he not stand up for his residents? And Richard did. He loved his residents, he fought the battles for them. Many of you may not have been aware of it, but quietly, diligently, he went about his duties. And I know officers at the County Council had a huge amount of time for Richard, went out of their way to help Richard, because he showed respect back. Personally, I would miss Richard really deeply. He was a lovely man, a kind man, a terrific father, and a brilliant husband to his children. Despite his health battles, he always came in cheerful, positive, happy. And how could he do something different? How could he change things? All I will say is that when the time comes for Richard's uh, burial, I hope that many of us in this chamber will pay our respects by doing everything we can to turn up on that day. I believe it will say a tremendous thank you from the people of Surrey to a great councillor, but also will send a message to his wife Camilla and the children for how much he was respected and loved by all of us. Thank you, Chairman. So now that, uh, Mr Chairman, you're in the, the seat that you've been looking forward to, can I first of all congratulate you and the Vice Chairman, Helen Clack, on your new roles. And I know that you will be a credit to the people of Surrey. It's a huge honour for anyone to be elected Chairman of this Council. It's a role that and it brings that person right into the heart of our communities, right into the heart of the voluntary sector, into the civic role. And it's really important that we never lose sight of that role. I'm sure that both yourself and, and Helen will be a great testament for Surrey. So now that there is a vacancy on the cabinet that Helen has left, I was wondering if anybody wanted a vacancy. But I am delighted to say I've asked Charlotte Morley to step up and take Helen's place. I have no doubt she'd be a great addition to the Cabinet. Thank you, Charlotte. So, Mr Chairman, this is one of the most important speeches I will make. In fact, it will be shorter than normal. As you all know, I became a councillor to make a difference to local people, just like all of us in this chamber. My background drove me to do everything I could to make a difference to people's lives. I never forgot the people who brought me up. Without them, I couldn't have achieved anything in life. We all have different backgrounds. I was brought up in care, and that embedded in me a deep desire to help others recognising that no one should be left behind. That will be a real challenge for all of us as we embark on some significant changes to our services. But we must succeed despite the stark realities that we face. Mr Chairman, the realities of our current position are 1. In 2011, the government transferred responsibility for 860 residents with severe learning disabilities from the National Health Service to Surrey County Council. The National Health Service transferred a funding of 65 million annually to Surrey so that we could continue to fulfill this important social duty we have. Over the past five or six years, I regret that funding has been slowly eroded by government and left us with not a single penny to look after these vulnerable residents in our communities. Now it is Surrey Council taxpayers who are footing that bill every year. In 2013, the government transferred the responsibilities for public health duties from the National Health Service to councils once again. 
the fund in Surrey receives falls short by 13 million annually. And once again, Surrey Council taxpayers are funding this bill every year. In recent years, we have welcomed unaccompanied asylum seeking children from abroad. But government funding does not meet the full cost of looking after them. Once again, leaving Surrey Council taxpayers to foot a bill of nearly five million a year. In addition, compared to similar counties, funding for Surrey roads falls short by 11 million a year. Mr. Chairman and members, these four items alone create a budget pressure of 90 million a year, a financial pressure that Surrey Council taxpayers are funding every year. There is no significant government funding being made available to meet these shortfalls. But in addition, this council continues to be faced with significant demand pressures. So let me just set out a few of these demand pressures. The number of children, of Surrey children, with statutory plans for special education needs and disabilities has risen by almost 40% since 2015. This means that we need to provide additional support to an extra 1,000 children and young people with special education needs and disabilities this year alone. <coughs> Surrey school population continues to rise above the national average. This means we will continue to have to find more school places from, from more funding. Working age adults with learning disabilities will be up to almost 18,000 by 2030. And there will be more than 82,000 elderly residents living alone by 2030, a rise of 34% on today's figures. In addition, we are fortunate in that many people in Surrey live longer than many others in other places. And the longer the people live, the greater number of complex health issues they may suffer. The chance of being diagnosed with other health issues, such as dementia, increases. This places huge strain on our adult social care budget. These, Mr Chairman and Members, are the harsh realities we are facing today. And that is the reason why we have to transform all services across the County Council and across Surrey. Mr Chairman, we have done our best to fight our corner for residents. We seek fairer funding for Surrey residents. We will continue to do so. We have saved 540 million from our budget since 2010. And we are on course this year to make savings and cost reductions of 106 million this year alone. But there are still huge financial hurdles ahead for this council. We, need to save, we still need to save a further 150 million in the next two financial years. The next couple of years are going to be tough, very tough. Tough for our residents, tough for every member in this chamber. Tough on the doorstep when we are explaining to residents why we have to reduce or change some services. It is not going to be easy. Our priority must be for children and adult social care services, as they are the most vital for our vulnerable residents. Sadly, this will mean reductions, <coughs> excuse me, reductions or changes in other services, which our residents and communities value highly. None of us in this chamber have ever expected to be in this position. None of us came into public life and public service to reduce services. I suspect None of us are happy doing this. But we have to live within our financial means and we have to balance our books every year. Our draft financial strategy that we will consider at Cabinet later this month and then in the Chamber in November sets out, it will set out the blueprint that will enable us to do this over the next few years. At the same time, we must focus on achieving improvement in outcomes. That is why we will deliver new ambitious plans to support children and families to our family resilience programme, as, well as, as well as through a new special educational needs plan to, and aims to intervene earlier and better. 
In the next few weeks, we will begin a series of consultations with Surrey residents and our partners on changes to subsidised bus services, remodelling our community recycling provision, transforming our library service, creating more vibrant community hubs, how we look at the use of children's centres as part of the early help offer and our youth offer for the most vulnerable. And finally, we have to look at a reform of our special education needs and disability strategy. Mr Chairman, we spend 70% of our budget on children and adult social care services. We have to look after children and older residents who need social care support. We cannot turn our backs on them. We cannot afford to fail them. They need us. We are their champion. But we must also be positive about the future. I believe we can manage these challenges. I have every confidence <coughs> excuse me, in the members and officers of this council that we can step up to the plate, change things, and make a real difference for our residents. What is needed is a different vision, a different focus, a change in culture to enable us to meet the demands and challenges that lie ahead. During the summer, we engage with our partners and residents to consult on the draft vision. I'm delighted to say that over 3,000 people took part, and I would like to thank every one of them who contributed and shared their thoughts and aspirations for the future of our great county. We will be discussing this vision later in today's meeting, but at this point, I would like to say <coughs> excuse me, that the heart of the vision is a clear commitment to partnership working. And that partnership shall be with Surrey and District Boroughs, the Surrey Voluntary and Community Groups, the Health Service, the Police Service, Parish Councils and Residents Associations, our business community, and most importantly, our residents. We already have a very good relationship with our partners but we need to embed this stronger into our DNA and take it further, much further. No longer can we simply say, we will deliver, or it's somebody else's problem. We must ask ourselves, who is best to deliver? Who is best to deliver a specific service for our residents? In some cases, it will be our district and borough partners. In others, it will be the voluntary and community sectors, or parish councils, or our residents associations or it may even be us. But there will be incidents when residents are best placed to do things for themselves, and our job will be to enable them to do that. What is essential if we are to succeed is that we all believe in this partnership. Part of the solution will be developing, will be developing deals, local deals, local deals that are different in different parts of the county, what will be right for Woking will be different what is right for Mole Valley or for Tandridge or for Spelthorne or for any of our districts. Inside those districts, in different communities, there will be different deals that we will need to make. We need to identify the best local solutions and be clear in our minds that local deals will mean local things for local communities and local councils and local people. The power is in our hands to change the way we do things. It's up to us to do that. Collectively, our strength will be significant and working in partnerships. We can build better futures for our residents. And it is the only option on the table. <coughs> While I welcomed the Prime Minister's speech last week, in which he promised support for public services will go up, we cannot assume there will be sufficient support to make a lasting difference to us today. We have to assume there will be no extra money. We have to assume that government may not be able to come to our aid. And the truth is that without change, our demographic pressures will be unsustainable. So let's harness our strengths and build a future, a better future, a brighter future together for our county, for our communities, and particularly for our residents. Thank you, Mr Chairman.